Good morning and welcome here this morning. We are excited to celebrate today the first Sunday of Advent. And Advent is a time where we anticipate the coming of our Lord Jesus. In John chapter 1, verse 1 to 6, it says, In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light, so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. So we invite you to stand with us this morning as we sing to our King of Heaven.
has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and have him strayed away. And this morning we're singing a new song, really focused on God's love. And um, I think when most people think of love, they think of all the um, mushy, gushy things of it. But in this sense, it's um, just the sacrifice and that God put it all on the line for us. Um, and that was risky, but he did it because none of it was about him. Um, but it was all instead. So this is reckless love. Thank you. 
welcome here this morning. My name is Pastor Zach, and I'm excited to be at church this morning. All right, Zach. All right, let's go. All right, announcement time. All right, our first announcement. If you are new with us, or if you are just recently started attending the Campus Church Baby, we would love to connect with, with you. And if you would like to connect with us back, we would love to resource you with whatever you need to get connected here at the Campus Church Baby. So, if you would like to get connected with us, please pull out your cell phone right now. And text welcome to that number right above my head right there. And if you're not quick enough to text that right now, it's also on the back of your bulletin. And we also have welcome cards that you can fill out. And uh, if you do that, you actually have to be new with us because here's the catch. There's actually a gift that comes with one of those. Uh, and it's a secret what it is. You have to fill out one out to figure that out. And we would also love to pray for you. So whether you've been attending here for years and years, all eight years of our existence, or if you're brand new with us and you have a prayer request, Please text pray to that exact same number. We would love for you to join us this Christmas. Uh, we're so happy that you're here today, but on Christmas Eve, we are doing a special, two special services, actually, at our Bayview storefront, which is actually right next door. You've got the Wimpy's, the paint store, the weird molding place where you paint, like, pots and stuff, and then you've got our Bayview storefront. Uh, so Christmas Eve, obviously December 24th, at 4 and 6 p.m., we are having our Christmas Eve service uh, on theme of hope. Uh, there's a Soul Sisters event um, this on Friday, December 1st at 7 p.m. and also at our baby storefront. If you are a lady, no men allowed, unfortunately, um, and you are looking to get connected in a women's group where uh, of all ages, all generations, just to connect and to um, do life together, Soul Sisters is a great spot uh, to do that. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but there's been a booth every, uh, the last few Sundays in a row out in our lobby. Uh, we are filling up our online directory. Now, what an online directory is, it, it, it helps us stay connected as a church. So all of your information goes on a database so that we can all stay connected. But here's the catch. You have to be on it in order to be able to gain the information of other people. So it's not just, you're not going to get random emails from like wherever in the world being like, hey, I got your information. No, you actually have to be part of the online directory um, to gain the information. Just a great way to stay connected. So please see that booth if you haven't already. Um, and as always... You can connect with us. All of our events, info, online directory, all that is at the campuschurchbaby.ca. Um, we would love for you to check that out. And uh, at this time, we're just going to go into a time of so, uh, time we call SOMA. And it is a word that means body and connection. Um, so as we dismiss the kids, you're just going to stand up and maybe chat with somebody you don't know this morning. Thank you. Well, this morning we're going to be uh, doing our third installment of three installments talking about mountain movers. If you've uh, missed the last two weeks, I'm going to kind of give you a, a snapshot of this. It's just asking two questions. Number one, who is a mountain mover? And number two is what is the prerequisite in order to be a mountain mover? This idea of being a mountain mover comes from Matthew uh, 17, where it says this, Jesus declares to his disciples, he says, truly I tell you this, if you have faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, you can move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Do you believe that this morning? Nothing will be impossible for you. You see, the catch that Jesus is doing here, the, the explanation that Jesus is giving, is really to his disciples who are a little bit confused. They're a little bit frustrated. Because they're, they're out trying to do ministry, trying to do what Jesus had asked them to do, and they'd seen Jesus do some things, and, and so they're trying to act like Jesus, be like Jesus, and they're trying to do these things, and it's not working for them. They're trying to pray for people. They're trying to do these miraculous signs and wonders as they felt God was leading them. And it wasn't happening. And when they came to Jesus to ask him, why are these things happening? Jesus explains it this way. And so what he's saying is that if we're aligned with the Father, if we're aligned with Jesus Christ himself, and we're, and we're doing the will of God, wow, things can really move. Mountains, even themselves, can move. 
And there's, uh, there's a prerequisite, and that's faith. So the answer to number one, who is a mountain mover? It's somebody who sees the impossible realized. I'll say it again. A mountain mover is somebody who sees the impossible realized, and here's the catch, in Jesus' name. So when they align themselves with Jesus Christ and the will of the Father, they are able to see the impossible realized, and the prerequisite is faith. Well, last week we, uh, or sorry, I should say two weeks ago, uh, we actually looked at this understanding of this mountain. And we said this mountain could be defined in a number of different ways. This mountain of, of ours could be defined as just a preferred future, a vision of what we'd like to see happen. Maybe it's a, a, a better family relationships within the context of our family. Maybe it's a, a stronger marriage. Maybe it's a repair of uh, a broken relationship. Maybe it's health challenges. Maybe it's uh, a business endeavors. Uh, maybe it's trying to figure out how to be economically sustainable. Whatever that, that vision is, whatever that challenge is ahead of us, we started to ask ourselves two weeks ago, what does that look like within our lives? And how can we understand that within the context of God's faithfulness to us? And so two weeks ago, we talked about looking in the past and looking at how God has been faithful throughout the generations and how God has been faithful within our context, even up till today. And when we understand that, then we can look forward. Last week, we began to ask the question, is God big enough? Is he strong enough? If you remember that Hebrew word that I use is El Shaddai. If God is almighty, is God big enough? Is he strong enough to be able to meet us in the midst of trying to figure out how to move this mountain? And so today I want to ask this question. Are we being faithful? Are we, as followers of Jesus Christ, are we in, in, in putting ourselves in a posture of faithfulness? Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we open up your scriptures today, we just ask that you would speak to us, O oh Lord. And may you help us get a, a, an understanding of what it means to be faithful to you. Lord Jesus, there's many things that uh, we dealt with this week on a personal level and as a corporate level. We just, we just ask, O oh, oh Holy Spirit, that you would take any distractions away from us. Help our, our phones to stop buzzing and, and, and things that, that just help them take them away, oh Lord, and help us focus in on your Holy Spirit and what you have to say to us right now. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Last week we talked, began to look at this understanding of faithfulness in the context of Abraham bringing home, over an offering. Do you remember that? And, and he, he brought forward an offering. And if you recall, and if you were here last week, we talked a lot about bringing towards God what is closest to our heart. And what was closest to Abraham's heart was his son Isaac. And God was challenging Abraham. Was he willing? Was he uh, willing to submit absolutely everything before God and saying, Lord, I surrender to you absolutely everything. I, I want to dig into a little bit more of what this means to be faithful and the faithful stewards of what God has entrusted to us. And so if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'm going to invite you to turn to Matthew and Matthew 25 begins like this, and Jesus gives us a parable. He says again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Notice that. And I think oftentimes we like to think of ourselves as being fair. You know, you, you should always be fair. 
But I, I think that if there's anything I've realized is that, you know what? God oftentimes entrusts us in different ways according to our ability. If there's anything I've learned as a parent, I always thought you're supposed to be exactly identical to all of your kids. But for those of us who have ever been part of raising children, you realize all of your children are really different. So that, what then is you, you become rearranging the rules, rearranging the expectations so that you can create success for your children. And God, I think, does the same. But in the analogy here, Jesus gives this parable that he gives bags of gold based on their ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put the money to work and gained five more bags. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more bags of gold. But the man who had received one bag went off and dug a hole in the ground and it hid his master's money. There we go. We're good to go. Put the, dig the hole, put the money in there. I think one of the th interesting things that comes out within the Greek a little bit more clearly is in the translation of the actual Greek, it's called talents. And even though that what it, in the Greek talents, uh, it doesn't necessarily relate at all to the English word talent, uh, I, I think the, the parallel is... Uh, Comparable in terms of talent. Are, are, are we using our gifts and are we give, using our abilities? Are we using our talents for God? A talent, uh, arguably, was about 6,000 denarii in Jesus' day. And so 6,000 denarii would be an equivalent roughly to about thirty to $40,000 Canadian in terms of buying power today. And so it's not, it's not a, a huge amount of wealth, but it's significant. I don't know about you, but if you're trusting somebody with thirty or forty thousand dollars of your money, I don't know. I, I, I you better trust them, right? <laughs> so now if you times that by five, oh, that's a that's a good sum of money. So you're looking at maybe two hundred thousand dollars that you're entrusting to a particular servant. And so you do it in good faith, and you they, I mean, essentially the, the way the parable plays out is this master who owns the wealth entrusts it to his servants. It says it goes away. Well, in the very next verse, it says this. After a long time, now, we don't know what a long time is. Maybe it's a short time, maybe it's a long time. Well, we know it's a long time. Maybe it's a month, maybe it's a couple of years. We don't know. But after a period of time has passed, the master, the owner of this wealth, returns and to his servants to settle his accounts with them. The man who had received the five bags of gold uh, brought the other five with him. So he's bringing back ten bags of gold. He's doubled the money. He says, Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained you five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many more things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Same was true in the next the man with the two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. The master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of statement I'm looking for when I stand before God. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of even more things. Come, share in your master's happiness. I think one of the things that drives forward here is this idea of, of 
there's a, there's a reward waiting here. But interestingly enough, you have two servants entrusted to different amounts. The reward, anybody pick up on it? The master's response was the same for the first two servants. Did you notice that? He didn't say to the first servant, well, I really like you because you made me five bags of gold and I sort of like you because you made me two. No, no, no. He says the same words. The master says the same things to his servants. Well done, good and faithful servant. The reward was based on the ability. The, uh, God wasn't, or, or sorry, the master wasn't saying to his servant, I was hoping that you were going to produce five bags of gold with two. That's not what he said. He says, I wanted you to be faithful with, with what I entrusted to you. Period. So are you faithful? He's saying, I entrusted you with this. He can't comes back. He sells his account. He's looking for this word of faithfulness. Were they faithful? And the answer was in the first two scenarios, yes. Well done, good and faithful servant. Oftentimes we think that we're supposed to be doing this and, and, and we're supposed to accomplish this. I think oftentimes as a church, it's so easy. Uh, I, even as a pastoral staff, we'll often talk about this. If only we had this. If only we had this. You know, there's a few of you this morning that um, are, are from the uh, Aurora Community Church. Uh, Chinese, is it Aurora? Sorry, please correct me. Aurora Community Chinese Church, is that? Yeah, okay. Chinese Church. All right. I, I, my apologies if I totally messed up the name. Uh, what we were talking about this morning, um, and uh, some of them are visiting with us this morning, and, and you know, bo both of our, our prayer is that, you know, wouldn't it be awesome if we were able to get a building sometime? Wouldn't it be awesome if we were able to, uh, you know, be able to find a space of our own? And maybe that's going to happen in 10 years, and 5 years, and 2 years, but you know what? It comes back down to saying, are we being faithful with wherever God has placed us? Amen. Are we being faithful in the context of wherever we're at? Are you being faithful in the context of your family, in the context of whatever God has entrusted with you? Are you being faithful? So I'm going to tell you right now, the response we want to hear from the master, our master, our king, Jesus Christ, we want him to be able to say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. And the opposite is also true of what it says here. The verses continue. You know, the, uh, the few verses that preceded verse 25 is, you know, this servant is making up excuses of why, uh, you know, there, he was, didn't do much with the uh, money. You know, and I think oftentimes when we don't use our talents and gifts and abilities for God, uh, we always have a good reason for it, don't we? This is what he says. I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, it is here. It belongs to you now. Here you go. You have it back now. Thank you. Thank you very much. I did nothing with it, but here you go. Here you go. Here you go back. Thank you. I was good and faithful, right? That's not what happened. Next verse. It says this in verse 27. Well then, you should have put the money on deposit, very least, with the bank. So that when I returned, at least, at the very least, I would have received interest on the money. The bare minimum. So he orders the money taken away. He says, take this bag of gold or this talent away from him and give it to the one who has the ten bags. Notice how there's a transition of gifting and wealth and blessing away from those that aren't faithful 
and those that aren't willing to use what God has entrusted to them, and it goes to those that are willing to be faithful and trust God. Verse 29, to those who use well what they have been given, even more will be given to them. And even and they will have it in abundance. I don't know about you, but you might be saying, that's not very fair. I gotta tell you. Who's in charge? The master is the one who chooses who to entrust. Those that are faithful, they will experience an abundance. But for those who are unfaithful, even what little they may or may not have will be taken away from them. I think these words we wrestle with a little bit. But what I'd say is, it draws us back and it should draw you back to the place of God. Am I being faithful? Am I being faithful? I wanted you to understand it this way. Imagine you're the stick person on the next slide. You know, whether you're a man or a woman, whatever you want, you just picture yourself as the stick person. This is my uh, extent of my artistic abilities. Okay? So, please see yourself in the stick person. Okay? So whether you believe in God or not, you are under the authority and the reign of God. So the next slide, we understand that you are under his authority, under his sovereignty. Last um, week, we talked a lot about God Almighty. And it's the fundamental basis of our theological understanding of God is Almighty, El today, And he has authority over all. And so whether we believe we're, and we submit ourselves to God or not, we are under his authority. And so everything that we possess, everything that we hold, is also under his authority. And so if we were to understand the, the application of the, the parable that Jesus was just explaining to us, is that what God entrusts to us is from him. So the next slide, you, you see this, like, it's not something that we do, it's what God has entrusted to us. And so whether we have just a little bit or we have an abundance, the reality is, is whatever you have has been entrusted to you by God. Do you believe that? It's not ours. The fundamental basis of what we need to understand is that our gifts, our abilities, our wealth, it's not yours. It's God's. And God has entrusted you and entrusted your abilities and, and, and he's bestowed certain blessings upon you. And then the question then becomes, am I being faithful? Am I being faithful? I love this story, and this is not a parable. What we just looked at was a parable, but this is a story that shows up in both the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke, and it goes like this. Jesus sat down opposite place where the offering were being put, and he was, and, sorry, and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. So, catch this for a second. Just so we understand this, we're visualizing this correctly. Jesus is in some kind of synagogue or maybe in the Temple Mount, and there's this offering space. Earlier we did an offering, and we invited people to participate. There's this offering in, at the front of the church. That's the best way I can describe it. And Jesus sits there like this. And watches everybody kind of line up and put their offering in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Think about that for a second. Jesus is watching. What? <laughs> Jesus is watching. Gets better. 
Jesus is not just watching who puts money in the offering. He's watching the amount, too. This is, this is really scary. Many rich people threw in large amounts. Whew. We're good to go. Everybody who, who is wealthy, we can breathe a little sigh of relief. But the next thing is, is the, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins. They're only one of the few sets. Why is she doing that? That's kind of weird. And so the couple things that I want to kind of draw out in this, first of all, Jesus is number one watching in this scenario. This is not a parable, by the way. Jesus is literally watching people put money in the offering. And, and, and the second thing is he's also taking note of the amount that people are putting in the offering. Oh, okay. So Jesus draws his disciples together. I wonder what Jesus is going to teach them. I, he's probably going to guess, I, I don't know, if you're an economics type of person, Jesus is probably going to say size matters here. You know, uh, if you have a lot of money to give, then you're good to go in the eyes of God. And if you're little, well, you're just, yeah, that's, that's a problem. Size matters. It's probably what Jesus is going to say. Well, I wonder. Because Jesus pulls his disciples and provides a teaching moment for them. He says this, truly I tell you. This poor widow, who put a measly few cents in, it might have bought us like the, the, the temple or the priests, you know, a cup of coffee at Tim Hortons. Not even enough at Starbucks. You know, this poor widow has put more in the offering than anybody else. What? Wait a second. That doesn't make any sense. She put more in the offering than anyone else. This is what Jesus is trying to get them to understand. See, the others, they gave out of their wealth. They gave out of their excess. But she, she gave out of her poverty and put in everything. All that she had to live on. That was all that she had. You see, one of the things that I think oftentimes we get confused on is that we think that the church is called, calling people to equal shares. You know, I've been even guilty of this, by the way, as your pastor. I've even said, you know, hey, we're running a deficit. You know, if everybody in the church was to give X, if everybody gave $100, we'd be good. And so everybody in the church would think, oh, okay, you know, I can, some people in the church say, okay, I can give $100. But there's some people who say, oh, if I give $100, it would mean my family would go hungry this week. I, I, I don't know how to do that. And, and so what I think the scriptures clearly start to articulate is God in God's economy, we're not called to equal shares we're called to equal sacrifice. We're called to equal sacrifice. I'll say it again. We are not called to equal shares. We are called to equal sacrifice. Do you remember the parable? Not all of the servants were entrusted equally, were they? But they were called to equally share the burden of being faithful. Faithfulness. Are you being faithful? I think one of the things as a church I often ask myself is the question, are we being faithful? Are we being as a church faithful to what God has called us to? I think there's some like, kind of legal or legalese pieces of being faithful. You know, as a church, we have obligations to the CRA, the Canadian Revenue Agency. We have obligations to make sure that our accounting and our books are organized in a correct way. But really, 
real you. That's simple. The, the real challenge and the thing that really kind of grips me and keeps me up at night is recognizing that we're handling as God, uh, as a church, God's money. You know, when, when we receive an offering and, and, and we receive that and it goes into a bank account, it's not, it's not the it's not the church, it's not your money if you call this church your home. It's not your money. It's not the board's money. It's not even as soon as you put in the offering plate, it's not your money anymore. It's not my money. It's your lead pastor. It's not my money. It's God's money. Oh man. So now if we're spending money and it's God's money as a church. We have to have a healthy fear recognizing that when we're spending something on behalf of God, we better know that not only is Jesus watching us collect the money, he's sure watching it. Like, is, is someone reaching into your pocket? Uh, so you see someone taking stuff out of your bank account? Let me ask you, are you going to take notice? If I just say, came over to you and said, hey, welcome here, and I started pulling money out of your wallet, <laughs> uh, how would you feel about that? And then, I, and then before you know, I'm, I'm spending money. I, you know, I, you're going to take notice. I'm telling you right now, there's a fear of God that comes with spending his money. And I'm telling you, it's a healthy thing. That's a good posture to have. I love the way Proverbs says this in Proverbs 1 7. Fear, the beginning of wisdom is fear of God. Or the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. We need to always have a, a sense of the way we spend our money within the context of our church, a real healthy fear. And I gotta ask ourselves if we're faithful with what God has entrusted to us, what happens? Anybody remember the parable? If we're faithful with what God has entrusted to us, what happens? Anybody know? Yeah, yeah, he gives, he gives louder. He gives us more. He entrusts us with more. If we're really saying, God, we believe you've called us, we call, you've called us to reach more people for you, Jesus, and we, we believe that we want to grow the kingdom of God, we got to say, okay, God, instead of looking over the fence and saying, oh, I wish we had that, I wish we had that, saying, no, 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 no. Are we being faithful with what God has entrusted with us today? Amen? Are we being faithful? You know, if you're visiting with us this morning, I'm just going to take a, a little bit of a hiatus uh, away from just a general application. And I want to talk a little bit to our, our congregation just for a second. If you call this church your home, I think really from a corporate church standpoint, we are called to that same statement on an individual and saying, God, am I being faithful as I participate with the church? You know what? You know, as a church, we're coming around to our, our year end. We're coming around to, you know, where God is, uh, or sorry, with our legal year end. And in terms of our general budget, we're in around numbers about eight to 10,000 behind plan. And, and together with that, I would say there's also some other expenses that we incurred this year uh, that as a leadership team, we took a few steps of faith. A great example would be we brought Pastor Zach on full time as of September. And, you know, I, I don't regret anything that we've done. Uh, but in round numbers, we're going to end up about 20000 behind plan if, we, if our givings just kind of continue on. And so the question then becomes, are we as a, as a corporate body of believers saying, are, are we being faithful? Uh, when somebody approached our leadership team, and we shared this on our vision night when we were talking about our finances, uh, just a few weeks ago, is uh, that there's a donor that's come to us and said, you know, and that's a part of our congregation, says, you know, if somebody wants to give anything towards kind of covering that shortfall, I'm going to match every dollar. And, and so if, if 
you ever, if you feel led in the next month where you'd like to give a gift and saying, God, I want to give this gift and I want to mark it to cover our shortfall above and beyond your general offering. Now, just mark it that way and a donor is going to donate above and beyond that and match dollar for dollar. And I, and I, you know, I hesitated sharing this in my message today, actually, because I don't want you to feel like I'm trying to give you some weird gimmicks um, and, and kind of apply some weird gimmicky things within my message. But I, what I want you to hear is that there, I, I think there's people within our context that are asking the question, how can I be faithful? And I, it's not just finances either, right? It, it, it applies to our gifts and abilities. It, gives, it applies to our finances. But I think all of us, whether you're in this church or outside of this church, I think that there's this context in which we talk about this umbrella and say, God, am, am I being faithful underneath this umbrella and trusting you as the authority of my life? If you go to the next slide, uh, in Malachi, it gives us this weird challenge as individuals. It says this, and it's one of the only places within Scripture I know of where God actually kind of taunts us who are followers of Him. He taunts us, literally. He challenges us. Bring the whole time into the storehouse. There may be food in my house, in my temple, the Lord declares. Test me in this, declares the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room in the store to store it. The idea is that farmers, people in the marketplace, merchants, it doesn't matter what their economic generating process was, it was saying, God, I trust you that you are the Lord of all, that you are over absolutely everything, and that whatever you're entrusting to us, we believe that you are the owner of it. And we are just stewards of it. And to show you, we're not just going to give you out of excess. Oh, I can do without this. No, it's saying, God, I'm trusting with you. I'm giving my first fruits over to you. I'm giving you my first 10%. I'm saying, God, I'm giving it over to you. And what God is challenging us here within the scripture is saying, try it. Try it. I love the next slide here. I was just trying to articulate this, that oftentimes we think of this idea, understanding that God blesses us. God, why aren't you blessing me? But we've got to understand that in God's economy, it's, it's not just a one-way thing. In God's economy... And I'm using the example of money, but I want you to know it doesn't just apply to money. It applies to our gifts, our talents, our abilities. But it also includes our money. It's saying, God, am I being faithful and trusting that you are the Lord of all? Do you remember I was talking about having this healthy fear of God when it comes to dealing with the church's money? Do you remember that? I think all of you who all of you who participate in giving to this church, I think I think you like hearing that. Uh, I do. <laughs> when I hear my offering in this church, uh, I'm glad that we're handling our finances in, in in a good manner. But let me ask you this: Do you take that same approach in how you handle your own finances? When you look at your bank account, when you look at your finances, what if you just etched out the name of the ownership at the top and put God's? Because ultimately, if we were to understand the theological understanding that God is Almighty, El today, and God is the one who is in control of everything, He is entrusting us and essentially. Uh, uh, just entrusting us to be good stewards of his resources. And so when we recognize that God is entrusting us with his resources, then it says, are we being faithful stewards? Are we being faithful stewards? I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up.
Eric, the last three weeks I've been opening up with asking this question, mountain movers, who is a mountain mover? What does it require, or what is required to be a mountain mover? And I, I just want to sum it up this way, to say that if you have mountains in your life, and we all have mountains in our life, but sometimes they seem overwhelming and sometimes they seem small. I think we have to look back and say, God, are you faithful? Okay, yes, great. We talked about that two weeks ago. Are you big enough? Are you strong enough? Okay, great. We talked about that last week. And finally today, I'm asking the question, are you being faithful? Are you being faithful to say, God, I really need you to move this mountain. I really, this mountain is so big in my life, I can't, I don't know how to handle it. Are you being faithful? God calls his servants, God calls his people to a place of faithfulness. And saying, God, I, I, I truly surrender all to you. I trust you as the Lord of my life. I'm going to invite you into that place this morning as we continue to worship. I just ask them the question, God, am I faithful to you? Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for how you are totally faithful to us. And we begin this whole message series understanding and remembering the truth of your scriptures and remembering that you are faithful throughout the generations and you've been faithful to us all the way throughout our lives. And that faithfulness can lead us to the promise that understanding that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13 tells us this and declares this, Lord, and we declare this as a congregation that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because of that, we ask that you, we would experience your faithfulness in our life. And in thus, we also say, Lord, you are worthy of our praise and you are worthy of our faithfulness to you. May we, may we surrender all to you as you are the Lord of our life, the Lord of everything that belongs to us. Because truly, you are the owner. And we trust you, Jesus. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we continue to worship today.
Thank you for joining us and worshiping with us this morning. Pray you go in the peace and the faithfulness of our